Good morning and welcome everybody to the International Symposium, Landscape Design in Latin America, Unpacking Theory, Practice and Agency. Hi, my name is Alexandra May. Um, I'm one of the three co-chairs of Women in Design here at JSD. Um, our mission as Women in Design is to advance gender equity both in and through our design work at the GSD, while also acknowledging and celebrating the women practitioners who are already pushing the bounds of the design fields. Hi, my name is Juan Santa Maria, and I'm the president of the Latin GSD student organization. The goal of the Latin GSD is to spread the discussion of topics that are currently, currently relevant to the disciplines of design, landscape, urban design, and planning in Latin America. And of course, to promote the integration between people interested in this region. This symposium uh, is the continuation of a conversation started two years ago by both Women in Design and Latin GSD. In the symposium titled Female Voices uh, in Latin American Architecture, with guests like Tatiana Bilbao, Frida Escobedo, Casu Segers, and Cala Guajaba. The discussion was hosted by GSD faculty members Anita Berespetia and Maria Nibáñez, opening an important dialogue from the new generation of talented designers. Now we want to expand this discussion to the role of landscape architecture in the Latin American continent, advanced through the work of the practitioners you will hear from today. The conversations today will bring together eight designers who approach the landscape through a range of lenses, including urbanism, architecture, ecology, and social engagement. We hope to generate a conversation between theory and practice, established firms and emerging voices, and the role of equity in design, as all are related to how landscape architecture is currently being defined in Latin America. Okay, so we want to express our gratitude for the support uh, of the Harvard GSD Dean's Office, the Landscape Architecture Department, the David Rockefeller Center for Latin American Studies, the Dean's Diversity Initiative, and the Student Forum. At the same time, we want to show gratitude for the intellectual support of Anita Veresbetia, Charles Valheim, and Pierre Belanger. And finally, we want to thank the work of the Symposium Committee, formed by Andrea Soto, Ana Mayoral, Adrian Boynton, Maril Collard, Claudio Tomateo, and Rowan Segovia. Um, so unfortunately, Anita will not be able to join us today, um, but we are delighted to introduce Sonia Dumplemann to give a few opening remarks. Sonia is an Associate Professor of Landscape Architecture here at the GSD, where she teaches many of our history and theory courses. She holds a PhD in La Landscape Architecture from the University of the Arts, Berlin, and an MLA from the Leibniz Universität Hanover. Sonia has curated exhibitions on landscape history in Germany and has worked as a landscape architect in Studio Paolo Birgi, Switzerland. She has held research fellowships at the German Historical Institute and at Dumbarton Oaks, Washington, DC. Sonia's work explores the transatlantic transfer of ideas, the role of politics, technology, and science, and the work of women in the field. Sonia will also be moderating the afternoon panel later today. Please join us in welcoming Sonia Dumplemann. So thank you very much, uh, Juan and Alexandra, for um, this lovely introduction. So on behalf of Anita Berespetia and the department, I would like to begin by uh, thanking the organizers. Uh, so again, Alexandra, uh, Juan, Adria Boynton, Anna Mayoral, and Andrea uh, Sodomorphine, Muriel Collar, Claudia Tomateo, Ruben Segovia. I'm sure I'm unfortunately mispronouncing your name, so please excuse me. I'll be learning as this kind of goes on. So anyways, a big thank you to you all for bringing uh, together, uh, together kind of the uh, really distinguished group of speakers today. Um, the GSD student groups, Women in Design and Latin GSD, have joined forces, as you just heard, in putting together two extraordinary panels with landscape architects, with scholars, um, and policymakers from many of the Latin American countries. And I would like to congratulate all involved on the work that you have done to get these practitioners and teachers to come here so that we can all learn from, the, from their experiences and about where the profession and its teaching in the academy are heading in Ecuador, in Chile, in Colombia, in Mexico, and in Venezuela. 
So a big thank you, therefore, in particular to our speakers um, today who have taken this long journey to Cambridge upon themselves to share thoughts, experience, and expertise. I think I'm probably the only one involved in this conference who has not been to Latin America. So, <laughs> so while that in some ways calls up really big red flags, at least I am a woman, I guess I can say. And I can say that I worked for a while, as Alexandra mentioned, as a designer in the office of Paolo Burghi, who often talked about his mentor, Louis Barragan. But that's the closest I have gotten. So in any case, I am very curious and eager to learn from our participants and audience today. So let me begin by saying that many people in the design professions of the built environment are familiar with some of the many well-known 20th century male figures like Roberto Bourle Marx, Oscar Niemeyer, Lucio Costa, Louis Barragan, who've been influential to in, in Latin American design. We may also be familiar with Le Corbusier, with Karl Brunner, with Werner Hegemann, and Jean-Claude Nicolas Forestier, to name just a few of the men who came to South America in the first half of the 20th century and who were fascinated with the continent and its opportunities for building. Many of us, however, may be less familiar with the women who have in various capacities been involved in shaping the built environment. So it is particularly delightful to see this initiative here today that also calls for some critical reflection on the histories that have been written to date and that have largely neglected the female designers, patrons, and clients, without whom many environments clearly would not be what they are. So a case in point with regards to landscape architects certainly is Roberto Bola Marx, who has for a long time overshadowed other landscape design contributions in Brazil with his, of course, undeniably skillful and iconic work. I would say he has not only overshadowed many of his compatriots, um, many of his compatriots, um, but as Zula Lima has shown, his, this almost exclusive attention to the work by uh, Bola Marx, at least when it comes to the outside and perhaps predominantly Western recognition and reception of re Brazilian and South American landscape architecture. So European landscape architects, for example, began uh, becoming enamored with Bola Marx's work in the 1950s. Um, so, so really, this focus on Bruno Marx has limited the recognition of the multifaceted history that constitutes modern Brazilian landscape representation and design. It can therefore be useful to note for example, that the cultural patron Mina Klabin had already promoted the use of native tropical vegetation and had, in fact, already designed some iconic modernist gardens in Sao Paulo by the time that Berlin Marx was only beginning his studies at the National School of Fine Arts in Rio de Janeiro. Later in his career, one of Bruno Marx's most notable projects, his interventions at the Flamengo Landfill Park in Rio, would not have been possible without the lobbying and support of the wealthy patron Loda Marreto Suarez. So Marreto Suarez was well connected within the circles of Rio de Janeiro's cultural and political elite. She had sponsored the work of modernist designers, including the architect Sergio Bernades, who built the house she shared with her long time companion, the North American poet and writer Elizabeth Bishop. In her capacity as a special advisor to the Parks Department, Lota Barredo Suarez ultimately pulled the strings to realize the Flamengo Landfill Park, providing Bola Marx and his assistants the opportunity to design several gardens for differently sized areas along the bay in the first place. So what we see in these two examples is that women often paved the way for men who then became the more famous and well-known figures. And indeed, there are several observations that we can make if we look back at the history of women in landscape architecture more generally. 
If we take the late 19th century as a starting point, when the first professional organizations were founded in countries like Germany and the United States, then we can observe that from the very beginning, women were part of the international networks of professionals who strove to promote, establish, and grow the new profession. Many traveled extensively as part of their own educational and professional development, and some even practiced in different countries, and I'm speaking now about the early 19th, uh, the early 20th, 20th century. So they were engaged in cross-cultural learning, um, training, and work. They were also prominent in building the modern educational and professional institutions of landscape architecture, and like their male colleagues, they contributed to landscape architectural education through learning and studio teaching at universities. They began assuming positions as university professors in the 1940s and 50s, and increasingly since that time, women have also entered other parts of public service. Many pioneering female landscape architects tended to be comparatively mobile, thus defying the association of women with the local and domestic and women's history with localized histories. Women simply had to be mobile since training and educational opportunities for them could not be found in every country. But they did not only travel for the educational purposes to study, explore sites and historic landscapes and to, con to attend conferences. Like their male colleagues, they designed landscapes in various places, often traveling hundreds of miles for site visits. And I'm talking about a period when they were not necessarily even traveling by car. Um, so the stories of female landscape architects therefore require, I think, a global and transnational outlook uh, that not only enables comparison, but also an integration of individual stories into larger international contexts. At the same time, histories of landscape architecture cannot be told without the study of the respective local contexts and environments. They are locally situated or grounded, and female practitioners and educators cannot necessarily be considered as a group with a shared agency either. So it is not for nothing that despite inviting a group of distinguished female practitioners and educators, this conference is, is, is entitled Landscape Architecture in Latin America. It is about much more than questions revolving around gender in landscape architecture. It is about the current state of the profession, or perhaps we had better say nascent profession. It will leave, I, I will actually leave this up to the participants, and I'm very curious to hear more and learn more um, about the state of the profession in Latin America. Uh, this conference is also about how landscape architecture is defined and organized in the various Latin American countries, and about how it is taught at the different educational institutions throughout, throughout Latin America. It is also about the different types of practice that constitute landscape architecture in this part of the world and the chances and challenges that professionals and educators face when it comes to the design, stewardship, conservation, and maintenance of designed landscapes. So in many ways, the challenges that Latin American countries have had to face in this last century have been enormous, and they are enormous. Military coups, dictatorships, corruption, terrorism, and failing economies are just some of the more general conditions that have shaped life and lives in many countries. Besides a growing range of social challenges, there are also numerous environmental challenges that professionals working at the intersections of the various design professions have to face. As numerous as these and other challenges appear to be, Latin America also has a wealth of pre-Columbian um, as well as colonial and post-colonial cultural legacies to build upon. This cultural wealth paired with the high number of different and oftentimes very extreme habitats and climate zones that, as Alexander, Alexander von Humboldt taught his fellow Europeans in the 19th century, expand horizontally but also vertically throughout the continent. So all these things have proven, proven a fruitful field for the practice of landscape architecture, as our participants will attest.
It appears that as in many other parts of the world, the Latin American landscapes that are subject to design, conservation, stewardship, and management are also subject to a variety of tensions. Tensions between modernism as a cultural expression or product on the one hand, and the lagging modernization of societies and economies on the other hand. Tensions between colonized and colonists, urban and peri-urban or rural space, between planned and unplanned space, and between the professions that are preoccupied with architecture and landscape. The professionalization of landscape architecture that I believe in many Latin American countries is still a relatively recent or unrealized endeavor, and the foundation of the first training institutions in higher education has also been an arduous process in many other countries, as has been the naming of the profession. So for example, in the United States, where the American Society of Landscape Architects was founded in 1899, the early self-proclaimed landscape architects had somewhat reluctantly chosen the term landscape architecture over landscape gardener um, for lack of better options. So recognizing the importance of formalizing a professional practice, Frederick Law Olmsted had preferred landscape architect because it, as he said, better carries the professional idea. It makes more important also so the idea of design, he suggested. And he went on, and I'm quoting him, Gardner includes service corresponding to that of carpenter and mason. Architect does not. Hence, it is more discriminating and prepares the minds of clients for dealing with, a prof with on professional principles. Considering the mere term architect as name, Armstead's disciple Charles Eliot pointed out that it could not capture his activity that entailed spatial planning at regional scales and would lead to misconceptions. Therefore, Charles Eliot explained, it was important that the term architect would be preceded by landscape. Landscape architecture, as Eliot saw it, was an art of design and covered agriculture, forestry, gardening, engineering, and even architecture itself. One of the earliest professional associations was founded in 1887 in Germany, and it was called the Association of Garden Artists. Some years later, another organization, the Association of Garden Architects, was founded. Both groups remained wedded to the garden in their titles, which, however, did not mean that members were only designing spatially confined and small landscapes. The opposite was actually the case. Many British landscape architects who finally founded the Institute of Landscape Architects, today's Landscape Institute in 1929, held on to the term landscape gardener into the 20th century. In 1930, the French uh, Society of Garden Architects was founded, followed in 1931 by the Danish Association of Landscape Architects, in 1935 by a Belgian, in 1950 by an Italian, and in 1976 by a Brazilian association, to name only a few, um, of course, in this context. So perhaps um, some seeds will be sown today for more and various and different types of foundations. Um, and in any case, I really look forward to learning more about landscape architecture in Latin America from our participants today. So please welcome all participants. Um, and uh, I look forward to um, hearing you all. Thank you. <coughs> Good morning. Uh, my name's Gareth. I'm an assistant professor of landscape architecture and senior research associate here at the GSD. And I've been asked to, to moderate uh, the first panel. And it's a great pleasure to, to um, introduce uh, our, our speakers. Uh, just before I do, I, I, Sonia's talk reminded me a little bit of um, the summer of 1996, which I spent in the office of Bertie Marx in, in Rio. And as someone who comes from Ireland, I, um, looking back, can say that had it not been for my maybe introduction to Bertie Marx, I may not have st stayed with the profession of landscape architecture. And so landscape architecture in Latin America has had a very real impact on, on my own life. 
in that summer, um, I was looking through some lectures that Bernie Marx gave, and I'm, right now I'm editing these lectures for, for publication in English. But in one of them, uh, he's described as a landscape gardener, and he crossed it out and wrote architect. And I'm told that he was very sensitive to being called a landscape gardener or to not being called a landscape architect. So I, I just something that came to mind as, as Sonia was talking about the history of the profession. I think few people would disagree that um, the profession of landscape architecture is not as strong in Latin America as it is in other parts of the world. Yet, in terms of practice and theory, it is very strong. So I'm really happy that our first panel this morning is dealing with practice and, and theory. Um, and so let me introduce our first speaker, um, Ana Maria Duran. Calisto is an architect from Quito, Ecuador. She co-founded the design firm Estudio A0 in 2002 after receiving the Master of Architecture from the University of Pennsylvania, and we studied there together along with uh, Jazz, Ana, Ana Maria's husband. And the Universidad San Francisco de Quito, uh, Estudio A0 has developed significant projects in Ecuador, and Ana Maria is currently uh, completing a PhD at UCLA. She's fantastic at multitasking. And uh, we're collaborating on a, on a book project, uh, Conversations on Ecological Urbanism in Latin America. And it's interesting to see how much landscape architecture uh, plays a role in that. So thank you, Ana Maria, for for coming. Thank you, Gary, for that generous introduction. Thank you to the Latin GSD. I won't go through all the names because I don't want to be unfair with anyone. But Andrea Soto has been my main interlocutor. So thank you for your great energy, and also to Juan, who's been helping me with the presentation. Today, I'm going to have to sing. I don't like reading in lectures, but because I'm going to be speaking more from the theoretical standpoint, and I will acknowledge it, I'm speaking more from ignorance and from a detached external observator stance, because I'm not a landscape architect. <laughs> I deeply admire landscape architects and, and the field of landscape architecture, but I have been practicing more as an architect who has become very interested in, in landscape issues. So now that I'm doing the PhD, and this is all Gary's fault, since he invited me to participate in Chile in a, in a symposium on ecological urbanism, I started thinking about, well, does, what does that mean in Latin America specifically? And one of the greatest challenges that I have come across is that we often engage our minds in finding relationships, and we think that's difficult, but the hard thing is to find differences. That's much more challenging. I feel that finding relationships has been easier in the case of understanding landscape uh, architecture in Latin America, but defining what is it that makes it different from the European tradition or the North American. Well, I include the US in my definition of Latin America, so I'm just going to speak about a Pan-American approach. And finding difference with our Asian counterpart uh, parts in the tropical areas, for example, is uh, much tougher. And that's the challenge that I wanted to, to take on um, because I do believe there are patterns and that there are differences. Two um, indexes, uh, we could call them like measurements of the pro proliferation of, um, of Latin Americans' fascination with this uh, paradigm of ecological urbanism are for me, one, the fact that the book Ecological Urbanism, its translation into Portuguese and Spanish was sold out in two years and it's not an inexpensive book and I don't think that datum should be underestimated. And the other is just like the sheer volume of case studies that you find when you start researching uh, the notion of ecological urbanism in, in the region. And I'm just going to go through this very fast. There's no time to discuss each one of these projects uh, separately. I've been looking at them since we started working on the book with Gary. And I keep on coming across case studies. You will notice that I have focused in the last 25 years, even though some projects span a larger time, just because they've been around longer. 
Um, and they are large scale. I have not looked at the private uh, at private gardens, for example, which are important, but I have focused more on like public parks. And don't pay attention to the taxonomy, but just to show you the sheer amount of landscape urbanism that is going on in the region, it's, it's just unbelievable. And this is not an exhaustive list. There are about 60 projects in here. You keep on finding them, oops, sorry, and finding them and finding them. And uh, then you start wondering, well, what is common and what is different? And um, OK, here's where I'm going to read a little bit. But I uh, can't see very well, so I'm a bit blind. OK, from the proliferation of theoretical and executed projects, large and small, that seek to reconcile natural and urban processes into holistic urban ecologies, it becomes clear that cities in Latin America are intellectually, politically, and economically committed to resurrecting nat natural substructures whose expression on the skin of the city, to use a term of Manuel de Sola Morales, has been suffocated by fast-paced urbanization in the last quarter of a century, and you could argue that since modernism. Um, Latin America does not resonate with all influences stemming from the developed areas of the world in equal measure. This is a very important point that I want to make. It is not merely a passive receptor of an active emitter. Its cultural independence is marked by the degree to which it embraces, rejects, or transforms cultural frameworks uh, imported from the developed world, but also insofar as it creates its own contributing to international conversations from the positionality of its particularities, context, and experiences. So we all have heard about cultural dependence developed by CEPAL, uh, whose main offices are in Santiago, actually. It's quite a beautiful building. In uh, you know, dependency theory, one of the main actors in dependency theory ended up becoming president of Brazil, Enrique Cardoso, and leading the continental integration of South America, COSIPLAN. And I feel that in dependence theory has overemphasized the flow of capital, of resources in general, human, natural, and capital, from the peripheries, as they call them, to the cores. And I feel that this one-way relationship has played against us, even though it does describe an important mechanism in the way we are inserted into the global economy, the political economy. But on the other hand, it also feels like we are forgetting that it's, you know, and this mural by Rivera in Detroit expresses it beautifully. The industrialization of the North has deeply dependent, depended on the extraction of natural resources and the labor of the South. But it's not so simple. I feel that between the extremes of dependency, which emphasizes the complete subservience of Latin America to the hegemonic power in turn, whether it was Portugal, Spain, or France afterwards, or England afterwards, or the US afterwards, and now China. On the other extreme, there's the notion of autonomy, which is more about isolation, which is not accurate either. So I feel that in the middle, we have concepts that have to do with resistance, and we sh should speak about resistance as much as we discuss dependency, because that's where we start finding the differences that define us. But more than resistance, I like the word creation, because creation is a form of resistance is a form of being somewhere between dependency and just copying models that come from abroad and full autonomy and pretending that you're not part of a larger system. And in terms of creation, what has been said about Latin American creators? That there are four main mechanisms in our processes of creativity. One of them, well, here I added regionalism last night because it's important. And that has to do more with the adaptation to local condition conditions of foreign models. Modernism is a case in point. We did a great job at taking modernism and adapting it to our local conditions, but we didn't produce modernism. So that's more towards the dependency side of the equation. Then we have the hybrid, you know, the, the productive and brutal forces of conquest and colonization defined as, as hybrid since the dawn of Latin America. And hybridizing seems to be a very important process for us in terms of being creative in agents. And the Canclini obviously is an important theoretician in this regard. Then I really like the concept of cannibalism, which is originally Brazilian, but Latin Americans have embraced it by the Andrade 
You know, it's back from the 70s, I believe, his manifesto. But you know, the idea that we consume as we are consumed, that we can derive from several sources from all over the world, the sources of our own creativity, and that we can, you know, those who want to consume exoticism and tropicalism, yes, go ahead, cannibalize us, but we are also going to cannibalize everyone else. So that's another really interesting concept, I think, of this, some sort of um, um, omnivorous approach to culture. And then the two critical ones for landscape architecture, because I feel that the other ones apply more to other fields, but deeply to landscape architecture, geography. Geography has played a, a crucial role in our search for our own identity since nation states emerged and we felt the need to define ourselves somehow. And we, you know, a lot has been written about the Latin Americans' search for its own identity. And this is a very elusive, almost mythical narrative, but it is important because it has affected creation in Latin America. And obviously the, the role that Journey plays, I mentioned Amereida, because it, was, it is a good uh, paradigm and an example of the way Latin American architects and landscape architects and urban planners and urban designers use the journey as a way to find an identity in the territory. And that has marked particularly landscape architects. And then archaeology, it cannot be underemphasized. Ironically, the only person I'm not going to discuss in this lecture is Bule Marx. Because my theory, after looking at all of this, is that landscape architecture in Latin America, even though as a profession, is very recent, too recent, but as practice, it's ancient, literally pre-Hispanic. So we're going to go all the way back in time. And of course, these, I just added this last night thinking in terms of like the potency of these geographies. Everybody's marked by them. I'm an architect, but what, what got me into a deep crisis was having to face the Amazon as an architect. How do you practice in the Amazon? How are you supposed to build there? The paradigm of modernism collapsed in my hands when I had to think about how do I do a building in the Amazon rainforest? And the reason why I'm doing a PhD right now is because I'm looking at the history of urbanization in the Amazon River Basin, and it is absolutely mind-boggling. But that's a whole other lecture. But the, you know, the power of this landscape marks us and mark our designs and the power of archaeology. When we were trying to define our identity, we went back to archaeology and started talking to this history. And these images, these presences in the territories have been absolutely critical in defining landscape architecture and architecture in Latin America from many standpoints. On the one hand, there's that like link to modernism, the passion for the raw, for brutalism, for textures, materials as they are, and obviously the honesty of materials, which is also another modern concept. But beyond that, there's this like complete so like this complete synergy between landscape, the territory, and architecture, the intervention upon it. This kind of intervention is stemming from animistic cultures. Ian McCargan, in his book, Design with Nature, emphasizes over and over again that the way we think about nature influences the way we intervene in it. And obviously, these animistic cultures are defining nature in very different terms. And that creates a very different relationship in which the hierarchy is completely the opposite from the European notion of coming from the Genesis Bible. You know, we control nature, nature is here to serve us, to we are part of nature, and there's no separation. It's a very different ontology. And it's hard to penetrate the indigenous ontology of nature, but I think it's critical to understand the way we practice landscape architecture in Latin America. And then thinking in terms of the contemporary condition of the city, and I drew this diagram thinking specifically about my city, but I've traveled in, in cities throughout Latin America and I see a very similar pattern. We, which are the, because to say that we have a different way of practicing is to say that we respond to a very different socio-political, cultural, economic condition. And one of the things that is interesting is that we have, you know, the traditional urban cores, which have been favelized. There's a lot to be said about the historic the districts in Latin America, the, the colonial cores. We have the typical gated communities imitating the American suburb, but in a, 
in a feudal pattern. So we have these like sprawl of walled gated communities. On the, and then we have the mega informal areas, self-built areas, and the peri-urban areas. That's why I included here the hinterland and the rural areas. Why? Because when you try to understand the causes, and the reason why I'm discussing the informal areas is because one of the things that you will notice in the case studies is that many of them are using landscape architecture to remediate informal areas and to respond to informal areas somehow. And there are some very interesting projects there. But when you look at the huge informal areas and you ask yourself you know, for, for the causes of what created them, and here's my own city, Quito, which is highly informal, although it has been integrated, but most of our cities, many of our cities are 70% informal, Mexico, Caracas, Guayaquil, and so on. Some less, that's like the greatest degree of informality, but it cannot be underestimated. And when you look at the possible causes, which is a very complex thing, but there are theories. On the one hand, the first explosion of informal areas was in the 1950s and 60s, and it was strongly correlated with the agra agrarian and colonization reforms. We wanted to destroy latifundia, uh, these huge land holdings. We wanted to be modern, go beyond the feudal system that we inherited from the colonial times. But the problem that this created is that it forgot that indigenous cultures had collective property regimes. And when it was replaced by a private property regimes, the regime, the land was fragmented into nuclear family units that, could not e that would not allow not even the family to survive. So even like very simple uh, agriculture just for family sustenance was not possible. So this was one of the first great contributions to the creation of slums. There was a huge migration. But then there are also you know, issues like the structural adjust adjustment program from the 1980s and 1990s that privatized reduce public spending, spending open borders, and reduce regulation, and so forth. A lot has been written about this. And um, what's interesting about this aspect here is that most of the disin disinvestment that happened because of the reduction of public spe spending occurred in the rural areas, in the hinterlands. So people suddenly had to use a strategy of multi-sited households where they would have some members of the family in the hinterlands, some members of the families in the forest, some members of the family in the informal areas of the city, and hopefully some members abroad so that they could benefit from remittances. So this becomes an informal strategy of survival. And it's all caused by what's happening back there. When you look at our political economy, and that is important to discuss because it impacts the way we design, our economies depend mainly on the export of food and oil. And then we can add other minerals, but it's basically extraction of raw materials, mining, oil, and food, agribusiness. All those industries expel people from the hinterlands. There's a lot of displacement. But on the other hand, they do offer jobs. So what do you do? You try to profit from all the possible economies that you have in Latin America. So we don't have, we have five minutes, oh God. We, we don't have, you know, like the case of like Europe or the states where cities industrialize and become poles that attract people because there are jobs in the city. What we have is the opposite. We have people to come to the cities in search of services, public education, health, eventually services like potable water, but our economies are totally in the hinterlands. So we become this like dislocated society and our slums exploded. And then of course, especially in the Colombian case, this is super important, the Cold War, the inheritance of the insurgency movements and the counterinsurgency movements, and they're taking place mainly in the hinterlands, but they become urban as well. And you could go on and on with all the causes for this condition, which has marked us as designers, as much as archaeology, and as much as geography. That's what defines us. In terms of the design principles that derive from this, well, we have the modernists that we discussed. The economy of means and austerity is a principle that comes over and over and over again in the texts of architects and landscape architects. Urban acupuncture is critically critical because this is a tradition that is fusing itself with the tradition of landscape urbanism and ecological urbanism of today. 
So we have this tradition of landscape architecture that, as I said, is millenary. It's not, it's not you know, just since the modern times. And then I'm not going to go into this. You guys know Curitiba. You guys know the Sola Morales and his urban acupuncture uh, theories, which are also important in Latin America. You know the case of Medellin, which is one of the cases I admire the most in the region. Because how do you create in a situation like this, where the state is associated with violence, how do you create a participatory process? It is virtually impossible. So what the Colombians did is like they started acting to create trust. There's no participation preceding this in the beginning. Participation came as trust was engendered by the actual fact of the making of the transformation of the urban skin. Skin in the sense that Sola Morales uses the term. And then, of course, the role that landscape has played in what I'm calling a Latin American paradigm that fuses the tradition of urban acupuncture, with, which is related to la adaptive reuse in North America, with the tradition of landscape and ecological urbanism. In these, like, I call them acupunctural, um, ecological acupunctures. And this comes over and over again in the case studies that I've been looking at. Uh, this is an important case in Mexico de Efe, the, um, the uh, Bosque de Chapultepec. Why? Because it's the only case that I have been able to find of an urban landscape architecture that has been alive since the Aztecs and up to this day. This was designed by the Aztecs and it's still part of an urban contemporary metropolis. It's fascinating. I cannot get in, into it as I would like to. But this in Mexico, there has been a development of a tradition that really looks at archaeology through Mario Shedham, who's trying to recover the milpas, the chinampas, as they call them in Mexico, who, you know, with all the, the culture that goes along it. So there's this like memory and this, ironically, this looking back to the pre Hispanic past to uh, be able to project a future. But without, you know, without just merely copying the, the model of the past either, because we're not, we're not in the pre-Hispanic days anymore. This is another super interesting case, because it's, a, it's about the notion of using the extraction site and remediating the extraction site. And when I speak about a convergence between North and South, in the North, they had to remediate post-industrial Deleric sites that they had left all over the place when industry migrated towards the, towards the, we call it east, industry is migrating west from the perspective of America. Um, and, and it's interesting because in Latin America, the equivalent were the extraction sites left over by industrial global capitalism. That's what we had to remediate. And you see it in Chile, where this mine becomes a pool. You see it in Curitiba, where the mines became uh, parks and a park system. You see it in every city. And in the core of the convergence between North and South is definitely Barcelona. Um, this is a project that Charles Valheim mentions in his book, The Cloverleaf Park. And uh, yes, I think the Sola Morales is the big link between Iberian America and North American Atlantic practices that don't always meet with such fur uh, because um, they share the palimpsest idea. There's this embedded notion of, like in Ian McCarg, you have the, the palimpsest of uh, all the layers of values. Here you have the historical palimpsest. And I feel that the, the, the notion of the palimpsest is what allowed these two traditions to, to fuse so, so neatly. And uh, I'm almost done. And then the way it's being applied, this is just a theoretical pro, uh, project, but I think it brilliantly illustrates in Sao Paulo how we are using just like in North America, the leftovers of infrastructure, the leftovers of radical topographies or hydrologies. Hydrology is very important. We're identifying these voids and trying to create networks of ecologies to relieve these hyperdense and congested areas in very many places. So it's almost like we're going back to the hydrological system, to this value in the ecological layers, but we are not designing new areas in the way Macar was doing or in the way Olmsted was doing. And I mentioned them because they're all part of this universal tradition. We are designing in areas that are already urban, but they're not the industrial delirate urban areas of the North, because we didn't industrialize like the North. With the exceptions, obviously, Sao Paulo, 
uh, Buenos Aires, I don't want to generalize. And uh, this is a case in Quito where there was a, um, I don't have time to get into this, uh, no. So anyway, that's, that's sad, but there are lots of precedents. There's a very deep history and what I have found, of course you cannot talk about this theme without discussing all the river projects that are happening in Medellin, in Santiago, in cities all over Latin America. It's the same story, but again, what I want to emphasize is, are just two things to conclude. One, we need to look at the history of landscape architecture, because otherwise it looks like we're dependent. I don't think that landscape urbanism and ecological urbanism is developed in the north and then it, boom, it, you know, it opens like a door for us. I think this is happening in Latin America and we simply enter into a synergy with the north because we still seek for legitimation in the north. But we've been doing this for a long time, so we really please need to look at the history of landscape architecture in the region. And the other thing, nation states do a disservice to research. We cannot look at Colombian landscape architecture, Chilean landscape architecture, Brazilian landscape architecture, Ecuadorian landscape architecture. We really need to look at the, lands the history of landscape architecture in the Latin American region, not excluding the United States. Now that I live in California, it is very clear to me that this country is part of the Latin American circuit historically not just through contemporary migration. So it's important to link all this history so that we can understand who we are and what are the differences and what makes Latin American landscape architecture and Latin American ecological urbanism particular to this region. And with that, I leave you. Thank you so much for your patience. <laughs> Thank you, Ana Maria. Um, I want to welcome Diana Wiesner, uh, founder and director of her own company, Architectura e Peixaiji, is that right? And Fundacion Saras de Bogota. Uh, she's been awarded several prizes in national and international biennales, focused on architecture, landscape, art, and sustainable construction, such as the next Green Awards of Bogota in, in uh, 2016. She's a member of the Consulting Council for Bogota's Planning and Verification Committee, part of the Editing Committee of Bogota as Nuestra, and a Nodo Sociedad Civil Leader for Landscape in Latin America Initiative. So thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for this kind invitation. I uh, want to talk uh, like a critic, autocritic uh, work for myself and in working in my country, Colombia. And uh, I would like to mention my mother, who used to take me along with her long walks throughout Colombia, so that I could learn from the country's artisans whom she worked with. I learned about the life stories, about they, how they craft their handmade products, and about how they felt about the natural landscapes that nourished them and inspired them. My lifelong work has been concentrated in interpreting the colors, the sorrows, and the strength that I encounter among people in these distincting landscapes landscapes that, are, that were the sediments of history and had settled deep into the soil, landscapes whose grand Andean and Amazonian horizons belong to all nations people who have the right to enjoy them and the duty to protect them, regardless of whether they live in the city or in the country. Today, these are the motives that move me as I spend my time between the design and the open fields of root activism. The guiding principles that I apply to any projects of any size are, first, to ensure the project will protect and enhance the site biodiversity. 
minimize the intervention and maximize the return for people. Place significant value on simplicity. Enhance the landscape so that it can be used for the educational and social contact. Focus the design on public life placed with cities right, so cities could be secure, human, healthy, sustainable, and resilient. And project and focus the design in ge its geographical <coughs> context. In real terms, the successful realization of any project in urban setting depends upon an agreement with your client. But uh, in this case, in the Magdalena River, when it is a government-sponsored project which depends upon political consensus, oftentimes nothing moves beyond the paper stage or the builders take it upon themselves to interpret or modify our landscape or original plans. So in my role as a landscape architect living and working in Latin America, I prefer to see myself as just one more link in the complex change of the landscape transformation. In my setting, a landscape author must fade into the background and let nature and the general public take the center stage. In my work, I consider myself to be a landscape artisan. This vision has been key of many projects, including one in China, where I work with the concept of a droplet of water as the symbolic key that allows a water to the enter a labyrinth of experience. Living in Colombia, it's like living in a labyrinth where you don't know where you're coming and where it's going to be the end of the surprise. And this labyrinth that winds through peaks and valleys among artificial topography and materials that we share between China and Colombia, such as the brick, or the hammocks to take a nap, a place where we can play as, as children and where water appears and then disappears. In another project near Bogota, we have focused on merging ecological forces with traditional agriculture methods in an area where the land is rich and productive and where people from rural, neo-rural, and urban areas can interact. The design process was based on community workshops resulting into a structure of social inclusion and multiplicity in activities which recovers the value of rurality as a symbol of renewal in post-conflict times in Colombia. Local law techniques were introduced into the design of a hard landscaping and natural based design in the soft landscape. For instance, water systems were integrated into the baseline when designing along with informational, didactic, or recreational elements. The sustainable drainage systems were incorporated, filtering water from macrophyte plants on the wetland. Another aspect of biodiversity that, that I emphasize in urban planning, such as this in Bogota in a very uh, pedestrian uh, project. And it was to be a very hard surface uh, with the architects. I recognize and design plan cracks in the pavement. So uh, we recognize what too often are considered weeds. So we designed these plant cracks in the pavement so this type of vegetation with no maintenance can grow between the cracks between mortar and bricks. Also in another project in Bogota, a public library, we designed with the prohibited materials that were in the normative of Bogota 
So we tried to allow an experience in the entrance of the building, of this public building, and uh, let the lovers put the notes in the pavement and to grow a different kind of uh, material so we have a, a different experience in the space. Other project in the city of Pasto seeks to recover riverbank areas formally modified by civil works. Restoring a river running through the landscape can also foster cultural manifestation such as those that take place during the carnival before many Colombian cities, or the January carnival in the city of Pasto where people can celebrate life. Running life, running water in any kind can also be placed in such an inspecting sites such as the roof of underground parking lots. We did this project uh, with a, um, an artificial river and water can flow in a private space that we uh, manage the way and democratize this space and it has become a public space. And uh, the water that is uh, this artificial river is moving because of the difference of temperature of the water avoiding mechanical complications. As native of Bogota, I know what it's like to live with rain year round. However, the city has traditionally channeled its rainwater into the underground sluice and have kept it out of sight. Strangely enough, the mountains, streams, and rivers that give Bogota its natural beauty have traditionally been pushed aside by urban development. Developers consider these natural wonders to be the mere border that frames the city. But these ecological resources have been not sufficiently recognized for what they really are, the regional axis around which social and environmental planning should revolve. Nine years ago, I propose a strategy as the biggest social agreement in the city, a pact with citizens, students, residents living near the mountains to preserve the natural border. The conservation pact is aimed not only at protecting Bogota mountain border, but also to bring it closer to the city inhabitants. Since that time, we have been working on Bogota's eastern mountainous perimeter to make it more accessible to the general population, to transform it into a place where Bogotanos can go see and understand how Bogota was a big lake, what it is now, and what it can become. In my role as a citizen and a landscape architect, committed with the situation in Colombia, I join hands with other members of the community who together volunteer time to whip up enthusiasm for our beautiful mountain range. However, we are not extreme conservationists. We want to find the perfect modus operandi under which nature and art and culture can survive in accordance with the terms decided of the entire community, to, weigh, to work in a multimodal thinking. All of these efforts, we have created the Bogota Mountain Foundation, La Fundación Cerros de Bogota, whose survival depends upon a large number of young volunteers who come and go depending upon the level of commitment. Every Friday since Two years ago, I hope this, this is a video. Ah, sorry. I should I expect that I, this is not functioning. Ah, list. Just have to. There it is. Thanks. Okay. Every year, every Friday, uh, since two years ago, we have been having this space in the mountains, and we invite every week all the citizens 
to bring up together to hear uh, speeches about urbanism, ecology, uh, landscape, um, and in one specific case, with the help of volunteers from three to 50, 50, uh, 75 years old, our foundation put together a transitory artistic installation on a site within the mountain reserve. Here we were talking about light and sound, and we'd spend the, the night and hearing the, the, the sounds of the mountains and the change of the light between the morning and the, and the atardecer. And every, every citizen were taking notes about this process. And then uh, we invited in another day uh, El Amanecer de un Paisaje with an artist and photographers. And we bring together um, like uh, experiments with the mirrors and seeing the, how they changed the, the nature, the colors. And every people was taking notes and giving drawings about this experiment. This is it's an open space to all citizens where we have uh, created. And this one was philosophy and reality. He's a philosopher, very recognized. He was talking about the imaginaries of Bogota and Don Manuel, who was talking about the reality of the cerros and the difficulties that we have. Every citizen were hearing all of these kind of experiences and then we finish, and that success led to the creation of a new space in the mountains, one that is available for public use and recreation. Achieving such conquests have helped us to multiply approach activism model with a room for a large number of actors. The first uh, talk was about geology and uh, the things that we have in the, in the rocks. And then people were understanding and having like this uh, way of uh, joining hands and putting together like a voice in the mountain uh, for, the, uh, for the mayor and the general city. This grassroots activism gives people the confidence that individually they can make a difference in protecting their environment. Along this line, we have sought up the cooperation of schools. We have more than 80 schools in the border of the <coughs> mountains. And uh, we uh, joined them with uh, all the children uh, in order to involve their students to the protection of this vital resource that belongs to them as future citizens who will bring up about change. Every idealistic vision for the future, every dream dream for the seven million Bogotanos inhabitants has become part of our plan. We are sharing our enthusiasm about staking out a new cultural territory so we can make a living map that will nourish our urban planning in the future. This drawing was made a four months volunteer time with citizens and we put in together, a, now it's exhibited in the Museum of Bogota, uh, but the experience was very uh, successful because now it has all uh, what uh, the different uh, people that lives in that mountains and what they were thinking and what they want to enhance. So uh, try to en enhance this territorial culture. Although uh, I am a citified Bogotana, my soul is in the countryside. This means that I can see how we in the city have placed our attention on urban problems and have ignored the rurality that surrounds us. Here you can see a map where this is Bogota 
25% of the territory is urban, and we have um, mostly of the, of the habitants living there. And the rural areas, that is the Paramo de Sumapaz and the Paramos, are the, the mostly uh, important part, the rural area, and the Sabana de Bogota, which is the most, most rich soil in the country for agriculture. We have it in the city. This is in the, uh, the territory of Bogota. So um, we need to recognize that rurality contains not only our greatest ecological wealth, but it is where we should be making every effort possible to preserve natural beauty. Now we are uh, in a discussion in Bogota about the future of the savanna or the, the Grand Plateau. One of my personal visions for the future revolves about, about the conservation of rurality. In one of the remaining marshly, this was a declared reserve rural zone left on the Bogota Plateau. This case, we have two competing landscape concepts under consideration. The mayor forces the zone being transformed into a model of urban planning with a strong dose of housing projects included. We as citizens, we have made a proposal to try to get a one view uh, for the future. So we imagine an alternative view that will preserve this remaining part of the rural landscape with the city's northern limits. A place where the future generation will have access to rural life without having to leave the city. This rurality will be there to preserve the value and significance of rural Colombia, which along with the country's cities is finally emerging from years of armed conflict in Colombia. The time has come for us to bring our intellectual forces together in an effort to protect and preserve our nation's biological diversity in a collective intelligence under, under this biodiversity complexity. Part of our socio sociopolitical transformation must be based on enhancing citizenship in the symphony of civilized democracy so that we could make the cities more equitable, more beautiful, more exciting, and more humane. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Jeanette Sorgi is an associate professor of landscape and urbanism at the design lab of Adolfo Ibanez University in Santiago, Chile. She holds a PhD in urban planning and design from the University of Genoa and was a visiting student here at the GSD um, three or four years ago. Um, since 2010, she has been teaching and collaborating in applied research projects in Italy, Germany, China, and Chile. She's author of Beyond Urbanism and editor of a book on Andrea Branzi. She's co-organizer of the Landscape as Urbanism in the Americas project with Charles Waltheim, Luis Calejas, and Felipe Vera, and principal investigator of the Part-Time Cities Research Project investigating the Chilean Central Coast. So thank you for joining us. Hello, and um, thank you very much, Gareth, for the introduction and uh, to Latin GSD and Women in Design for inviting me here. It's really a pleasure to be at the GSD again and uh, share my experience on working on landscape and urbanism in South America. I have switched your map as the Chilean landscape doesn't allow the, vertical, the horizontal format. So, um, as Gareth just mentioned, I worked in a few countries, mostly in Italy, Germany, and I studied here at the GSD. And uh, my main focus has always been how landscape can be a productive medium for urban planning and design. 
Since I moved to Chile in three, three years ago, I have been working on a few research projects, three of which I will show today, that in a way try to frame questions that are specific to the Latin American context, but that also can relate to global issues of urbanization. Um, as Ana Maria and um, Sonia were, were presenting, like what is a bit the difference of working in the Latin American landscape, especially from a, uh, somebody coming from Europe, um, First of all, the scale that is immense for me. Like, while the European landscape is characterized by a very dense pattern of cities and towns, and, the, and they're very much related to each other and to the surrounding uh, territory, the scale of the Latin American landscape is immense. Vast areas are still uninhabited, and um, the population is co mostly concentrated in a few major cities. In the case of Chile, 40% um, of the population lives in Santiago. The rest is still, and again, I speak mostly from my experience in Chile, uh, is still mostly understood as a resource to be exploited. This attitude, as we mentioned already today, dates back to the Spaniard colonization and extends to today's global economies. So Latin American forests, agricultural fields, mineral resources have provided a foundation for the very um, development of the cities a few centuries ago and still are the main source of income for these cities. So for me, the question, in a way, in these projects I have been working on in the last few years, is how can landscape as a concept and a design principle uh, become a medium to mitigate some of the issues such as inequality, contamination, population displacement that emerge exactly for this, from this uninhibited process of exploitation. So how can landscape provide a ground, an infrastructure, and a palimpsest for future transformations? Um, how does it work? Ah, sorry. Yes. So the first project um, I want to show today, and probably some of you are familiar with it, um, is called Territories of Extraction and is focused on the um, mining territories in the north of Chile. Uh, I, was, I'm working on the I have been working on the project with my colleagues Felipe Vera and Luis Valenzuela, who was also teaching here a couple of years ago. Maybe some of you took the course with him. Um, so as uh, you may know, Chile concentrates 40% of the world's reserves of copper. Most of it is in the hands in, uh, of a few major companies, private companies, national and international, and one national, one Codelco, which, was, um, which owns like 30% of the market and uh, is the company that was uh, supporting this study. Um, yeah, so Chile yeah, today still provides 30% of the copper that is expor uh, exported in the world. And because of that, uh, mining companies and in general the mining industry have a strong power in defining what is the future for cities and territories in Chile. Um, this is Chuquicamata, which is one, uh, in the area that we were studying that is still one of the biggest open pit mine in the world. Um, Calama is the center that we have been studying, which is at the center of this cluster, located in the desert of Atacama, in the north of Chile, one of the driest areas in the world. And an area that in the last years um, gained a lot of attention because of the struggle uh, generated by the um, uh, externalities produced by mining, mostly uh, pollution and um, uh, the gen uh, like social uh, degeneration, and um, and this was um, even more extreme because while this area produces most of the wealth of the country, these um, these benefits are not reinvested in the same town. Um, even so, they. Um, Residents uh, literally took the street, uh, asking for more uh, services, more equities, and um, and the project tried to understand. Uh, already there was a plan uh, done by Elemental and Aravena, and our contribution was also to keep seeing how this project could develop. Um, so. As we said, like, it's a medium-sized town, Calama, like it's, it has 150,000 inhabitants. But in a way, when we were looking at it, like, it started to become clear that uh, many stakeholders decide for the future of the city. The first ones are the citizens, and the town mostly developed because of mining, so it basically did almost not exist without mining, and it's developed starting from the 60s. 
And this uh, actor, the resident, is um, somebody who lives in the boundaries of the city. They pay taxes, and therefore they want more services. They want their voice to be heard. And they expect to, have, um, to, uh, to be able to establish a life that doesn't necessarily just depend on the mining resource. Um, Yes, so the, the city keeps growing at a very fast rate, expanding towards the desert or on top of the oasis, because Kalama was also the site of the, one of the biggest oasis in the world. So as we said, they ask for better spaces, for their children, for their relatives. Okay, um, a second group or actor that has a very strong impact on uh, these mining towns are the commuters, which are not acknowledged uh, in the number of residents, but nevertheless are a very uh, huge number. Like we have estimated that like 10, 15% of the population flies in and out every day, like around 10,000 people. And not to mention all the people living in the region that go for the day, people living in mining camps, which is the other possibility for extraction territories, um, so that they live in the camp near the pits, but nevertheless, they use the infrastructure, the facilities, and the services of the city without assuming the responsibility and the cost for it. This is kind of the spatial uh, outcomes of uh, these uh, temporary um, floating uh, population, and they, um, so new hotels and temporary housing, etc., overlap on what is the urban fabric. And, but there was also, um, there is also a third group that doesn't have that much power like the other ones, and is of course their residents, the indigenous population, but their relation to the landscape, uh, to the territory, is very different, because uh, they have been living in the area since 500 before Christ, uh, establishing um, a relationship with the natural resources of the area, which is very different from the one of extraction. Um, Yes, for many centuries they have been cultivating the river that uh, brings the water to the oasis. Um, they still long, uh, live along it. Um, they have special rights on the use of water. And um, it's also where like, the, um, their ancestors are buried, and so they have a very strong attachment to these areas and where archaeological sites um, are created in the last years. And finally, um, of course, there, was a, there is a fourth stakeholder, which is the one that has the mo most of the power, which are the executives of uh, mining companies or other enterprises related to it. The, this group of people is actually absent from the city. Like Many live in Santiago, but they also live in Canada, in the United States, in Asia. And uh, nevertheless, they are the ones who take most of the decision for the future of this territory. Um, and they are the ones that um, affect most of the other activities. So a lot of conflicts we are emerging out of these groups that we have simplified in four actors, but could be many more. And one of the clearest examples of this, for example, is the use of water. Mining is highly um, polluting for water. Water is the main resource that the indigenous population need in order to consolidate their landscape. Uh, the oasis is also the most valuable place in the city for the residents, and so on. Um, also, the production of the waste of mining, like compared to the scale of the city, and the, and the impact it has on its few natural resources. The, we have estimated that the oasis shrink to 10% of what it was in the 1960s. In a way, putting at risk these very precious desert ecologies that, in a way, we're not sure that can be restored even after mining will be over. And that's the other point which was very important inside the, uh, within the research project, is that most of mining cities and mining camps have an expiration date. Like, as the relation with the territory is based on the resources, when the resources are over, um, the mine pit is not needed anymore. So Codelco, who sponsored this thing, like the two main things that they were putting on the table were that in the next 30, 40 years, they will need um, all their income will come from new operations, which is, is 85%, while the existing mine pit will produce only the 15%. So many more new camps and city will need to grow in different locations in order to um, generate the same income they had for now. And um, 
but the other thing is that, so this means a lot of new workers that in a way had to be located uh, in the city of Kalama or in nearby camps. But it's also well acknowledged that like mining companies are also investing in um, technologies that will allow um, to run the mining operations without workers. So basically using robots for underground operations. So the question is, OK, we, can, um, we want to uh, improve the quality of the cities and so on, but why don't we ask what is going to happen when mining will not exist anymore, like all this money that has been invested? What is happening to the indigenous population? What is happening to people who leave their family there? The work I'm showing now is very speculative. It has been run in the studios. I have been teaching with my colleague Felipe Vera, and in a few workshops and theses I have been advising in Chile. And um, so in the first place, we found in games a very good instrument to understand landscape dynamics, to individuate actors that play a role in a context. We asked the students to design a board that resemble the city or parts of the city and understand how different actors interact with each other and what are the rules in a way that determine one outcome or the other. So here are some of them, for example, focusing um, on the oasis, which is the area with the most value for all the groups. So they had imagined like ecologists and the indigenous population and stakeholders and the re um, yeah, um, real estate developers and so on fighting for interest? Or what would it mean to increase the density of uh, some areas, reusing gray water for food production that in a way would make the city self-sustainable for this short time? Or looking at the whole city, how to intervene in the most sensitive areas and um, in order to develop strategies of uh, landscape comp uh, compensation um, reusing the investment that mining would do to like counterpart the effects of it, and uh, or for example intervening in the border with the um, with the desert and um, mitigating the effects of dust and um, air contamination. So putting again in relation the city with its mining pits, and another uh, strategy that we were somehow looking at is that maybe these um, settlements, like the mining camps for the new workers that are needed, and this could have happened even before, could be really understood as temporary. So working with the assembly disassembly technologies that have a hard component, which is the housing, and the soft component, which is the, um, the natural part, like these small gardens that could improve, like, uh, improve the quality of the same camp, like increasing the level of oxygen, and at the same time leave a legacy to the population that will stay in the area. So how can landscape design, in a way, um, become a medium to have these actors dia uh, establishing a dialogue with each other and uh, putting these different uh, spatial and temporal scale in relation? We also try to imagine strategies of restoration and reclamation, taking into account that, uh, for example, in the case of the oasis, the process has to start now, and also what it would mean to reclaim the mining pit. And, uh, and also how maybe this infrastructure, this huge infrastructure that mining has put together in order to connect this uh, very local and marginal context, like the north of Chile, the desert of Atacama, to the rest of the world through streets and airports and uh, um, economic networks and so on. How can this instead be, for example, converted in a process of uh, uh, reclamation and so transforming this into a study to understand how to uh, develop strategies of reclamation and put it in network with other cities and countries that are going through the same process. Um, so in a way, using landscape, uh, as I was saying, the question posed in the beginning, how can landscape uh, be a medium to create these balances and try to adjust some of the inequalities that are produced? Um, in a way, landscape can, uh, as a concept and a medium, can be the um, the way in which these different actors, their temporalities, their spatial in, uh, impact, are put in relation to each other, avoiding like uh, what is happening right now, that uh, mining camps are either abandoned or buried by their own waste, as it happened in the case of Kalama. That has to be displaced to Kalama, actually, because uh, the mining operations needed the site. Um, so the second 
project, and I'll try to be faster. Um, the second project I want to show uh, is the um, uh, comp international competition, idea competitions we have organized in Chile last year, together again with my colleague Felipe Vera and James Robinson, who is an ecologist teaching at the Universidad de Chile. And um, uh, the aim of the competition was to design a new park for a metropolitan area in Santiago in which uh, productive landscapes of agriculture, energy fields, water treatments, uh, plants, and so on, could coexist with biodiversity protection, recreational activities, and sustainable housing. Um, the site of the competition uh, is a plot of 1,000 hectares, which is really huge, like you would say, compared to the city, and that is owned by a private uh, family company. And, um, and it is located in the belt that surrounds the city of Santiago. So part of the area is uh, part of a ecology protection site, ecological priority site. And, but the label doesn't really mean anything, because it doesn't give the um, uh, legislative power, nor resources um, for the, um, the region or for the municipality to protect this biodiversity, nor to make it accessible to the local or to the metropolitan population. Um, nor does it allow to prevent illegal activities, such as, again, copper mining that are happening under the site, which is an ecology project, uh, protection site. So the first thing that we asked, uh, that the first challenge that we put in the brief of the competition was um, to explore the potential of the site at the metropolitan scale. So how it become, could become a, an environmental and recreational resource for the seven million inhabitants uh, of Santiago that live in the metropolitan area. And um, also suggesting to link it to systems of food production that could, in a way, self-maintain part of the area, like uh, other examples, successful examples happening in Europe. Um, another important aspect that we were exploring through this competition, the, here you can see this, the site compared to the size of the city, is that the site is uh, located in one of the in the in in an area with one of the lowest uh, where the lowest socioeconomic groups live, but nevertheless, um, many kind of private condominium or gated communities are uh, of uh, upper middle class are emerging in the areas. Um, because of the low price of the land and the beauty of the landscape. So um, the second challenge was, in a way, how can whatever project that is going to be developed in the area um, also provide some kind of services to the community, become um, a place for social interaction and um, compensate what has been like the relentless urban development that has been driving the expansion of Santiago. And finally, how to organize and give a meaning to the many activities that were already uh, present on the site, and how can, uh, in a way, like landscape design, also be a medium to convert, uh, to um, orchestrate like different uh, productive activities like agriculture and energy production, water treatment, and like yes, organize these peri-urban areas. So the winning competition, the winning, I will quickly go through the project. So the winning project is a, a team from Colombia uh, called Mapas Arquitectura y Territorio. And what they suggested was to um, create a set of uh, productive um, uh, landscapes that would um, organize the, say, uh, the area also through a few agri uh, architectural elements that in a way were uh, reminding the geoglyphos, um, uh, which, which are the signs of uh, um, ancient uh, pre-Columbian populations, and uh, collecting like the water that was coming from site and how this could be maintained in a way the, the area and making it accessible to the population, therefore creating a public space for the community and for the um, municipality and for the metropolitan area. Um, this is another project by a Spanish-Italian team, which was that used a more organic approach to it. So again, defining the site through the water streams. Um, this 
proposal. This, that I'm showing now, they are honorable mention proposals. Um, this proposal was instead all based on agricultural um, production system, so small scale, larger scale, trying to uh, understanding how this could create new economies um, for the local areas, welcome tourists, and um, uh, yes, reactivate this area through alternative economic systems. In a way, reestablishing this uh, agricultural peri-urban uh, belt, not as something like alter to the city, but in, co in strong communication with it. And finally, another of the honorable mention, Constellación Urbana, also from a Colombian team, they propose a set of landscape strategies for biodiversity, conservation, social activities, um, smaller and larger scale urban development, and so on, um, strongly uh, related to the activities already present in the areas, and that in a way could be replicated all around the city of Santiago, like establishing a sort of new constellation, peri-urban, uh, rural-urban interface. Uh, yeah, some of the results uh, have been published, um, shown in an um, exhibition at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Santiago, and the idea was to use it as a way to keep engaging with the municipality. And the same question um, that was posed before, no? so how can landscape be a medium? In this case, again, like um, all these landscape design projects, it would allow to put the area in relation, not just with the local context, but also with the metropolitan area around it and um, create like new interactions between local community, tourists, investors, and um, in a way so orchestrate the different interests of these stakeholders. And yeah, a book also came out of it. Um, finally, and I will use this to conclude, um, this project is very new, it just <laughs> started, so um, I'll just use it to um, conclude. and. Um, it's called part-time cities, coastal landscapes, and um, and basically it came from my experience as an Italian and a European living on the Mediterranean coast and having seen what happened to our coast because of seasonal landscape and tourism. So this, uh, I'm focusing on the central coast of Chile, which is basically an extension of the city of Santiago, where people buy their second house and go for weekends and vacation. And um, this is kind of the urban development that is happening on this area, built mostly in the last 20, 30 years of um, wild real estate speculation. And so, I mean, again, going back to my experience, we have all seen how tourism can be an incredible economic resource and how it can help uh, preserving the um, natural heritage and the cultural heritage of a site, but it also often generates processes of alienation, gentrification, disconnecting the site that is interested by this development from the real economy of the place and the people that will live there all year long, whereas most of, and especially uh, seasonal tourism and coastal tourism are usually characterized by a very intense and short use in specific times of the year and in which all the infrastructure collapse and then a very little um, population that can take care of them during the year. So these are some of the, this is just a review that we are doing through the coast in the time, try to understand the different patterns and so on. But Again, the question of why landscape has to come in, in understanding these areas and working in these areas is because, in a way, if like, urban design and architecture are determined by fixity and they need to work with property and they need to work with um, uh, setting up uh, land use and, and their maintenance, um, in a way, landscape can allow us uh, this flexibility. By connotation, it's open and it also consists of public space and public interest. Um, in which these different aspirations can found can find like a place of uh, interaction, and um, so yeah, not only there is almost no regulation in this area, but also pro punctual projects of urban design, such as Teresa Mulder <laughs> project in Punta Pite. I don't know if you will show it. It's an amazing project. Are a very rare exception. Like there are very few pro open uh, public spaces that can. Um, hosts different activities that can link private occupation of the site with the 
uh, temporal duties and local inhabitants. So most of the questions that are put in place is how to be, build bigger pools, have a better view, have more privacy, more private space. And the, um, yeah, so the question is how can this, in a way, in the areas that still have not been interested by this uh, wild real estate development, how maybe we can think of it in a different way. Thank you very much. Theresa Muller is someone I've wanted to meet for a long time. Um, she is a landscape architect from Santiago de Chile and founder of Theresa Muller and Associates. She's been working in landscape architecture for the past 30 years or so. Theresa finds careful observation and awareness of the landscape key to developing successful social cultural projects. Making landscape accessible to people is essential to her work philosophy. Teresa works with a diversity of landscapes in Chile, from the Atacama Desert in the north to the lakes and glaciers of the south. They've been the setting for most of her projects, um, which we look forward to, to seeing, and uh, which are also shared in her book, Unveiling the Landscape. So thank you very much, Teresa, for, for coming. Disappear. So, if anybody found a telephone, it's mine. <laughs> okay. Um, first of all, I would like to thank you for inviting me to participate in this symposium. It was a great surprise for me, as so many beautiful things that, that have happened in my life. My intention here today is to share with you my experience as a landscape designer working for the last 30 years, mostly in my country, Chile. As you will see, my work has a very instinctive approach to the question. I think the strongest idea that support my work is a deep commitment with the essence of each of the places I have been asked to work in. Essence means the most important quality or feature that makes something what it is. I am not an academic person, but I have had great opportunities to be in nature and to get deeply touched by it. I remember being a girl spending lots of time lying under the trees, just looking how the leaves were dancing over myself, made me feel so good. I never thought I was going to be in this position, like today, having people interested in my work. I have just done what I like to do so much, working really hard in and with nature, giving all my energy in what I am doing. I love to be in nature. I love to work with nature. I thought the best way to explain my work is by answering some questions. What do I do? I attempt to rescue the value that is in the essence of a place and to be aware of anything that would prevent people from not experiencing nature. Why do I do this? I, everything I do is for the people so they can be in nature. I think bringing people into nature is so, so important because it helps us so much to understand who we are, because we are nature. How do I do that? I do it with great simplicity, working with what is available. Simplicity means the quality of being natural and plain, 
keeping the idea of making thrifty projects seriously the most sustainable. You will find common ideas behind my projects. One is the idea of the line. I have this idea about the line in the landscape going around my head for a long time. How does man touch or work with nature? If you try to reprodu reproduce nature as it is, it will be a disaster. If you think how man has inhabited the world from early beginnings, the line was the way to connect in nature. If you think first steps from a man working from one point to the other, some irrigation systems came after, fences, bridges, trains crossing the landscape, airplanes leaving this line in the sky, and so on. All are the most simple and efficient way of connection of two points. And as a result, I think, is the most beautiful intervention man can do in nature. It's the one that works. Then I have another idea of that aesthetic is not enough anymore. What I mean is, nowadays, we need to take care of so many things because we are so many in this world. So first, we attend the need. Then, beauty should come as the result of our well-done work. We will be looking at projects that will give us some explanation to what I just said. Most of my work has been done in Chile, where we have all this amazing variety of geography, from desert in the north to very green rainforest in the south. We'll go first to this Punta Pite project uh, that is <clears throat> located in the center of Chile. And it's this 11 piece of land, 11 hectares of land that roughly sits on the Pacific Ocean. Uh, I can show with this. Is this this is Ponte Pite, and and you can see here is really a, something strong that that gets in in the ocean. We develop this project for 29 sites on a private condominium that we were asked to design all the common areas. So we have parks, paths, terraces, and different places to do. Um, it was, I want you to hear the stone that is being cut, but it's, there is no sound enough. Um, we were asked to design, um, it was this two years work in situ, directing these 30 people which became a clinic of stonework handling. Everybody that works there, now it is uh, somebody that has the background and get new projects to work in, in stone. Once a week, I would go there and direct personally the work. These are some of the terraces that we built for people to help them to get in water. The path is a 1.2 kilometers, giving people the opportunity to walk through a rock that is very rough. The line is the, de is the design basis for this project. Here the question was, I was coming with a path through here and I had to go all the way up. So I had to choose how to get from the bottom to the top. 
I have to, I ask myself, like, how do I reach the sky from here? And this is how it came. Um, uh -oh, back. So we start uh, building little by little, st step by step, with solid pieces of granite from the place. And what is nice is that allowed people to get out of the steps and explore around or just sit there to have a conversation with the ocean. You can see here, you can go out from the steps all the time. And at the end of the path, we find the park where there were these old trees that were safe because uh, the site was for one more of the sites uh, for sale to, to be sold. But the, the owners understood that saving this place would add value to it in many aspects. So we have a common place for everybody. It was left as a public spa park. Then um, we found this historical place where a naval battle because a naval battle took place here. So this excavation, the one that you see here, was done at the time to place a canyon. Um, we decided to mark it with this stone that was worked by sculptor Gerardo Aristilla to hold the rainwater. I recommend to walk the path by yourself so you will have to find your own way. It has become sort of a spiritual poetic experience that gives you some special feelings. A young architect just did it the other day and sent me these words. I believe that people have to understand that this is absolutely necessary. Punta de Pite feels your heart and spirit. That's right. And this is necessary for humanity. We have to feel our spirit and this is one of the works that allows it. Makes me feel so fun, so happy, no? Ah, oh. okay. Just to show you, because I erased many projects because I didn't have the time to show you everything, but I was thinking that it was sad that I erased this, but it's still a little bit of it. This is Kalama, it's the same town that she was talking about, and this is a, a huge park that we did, surrounded one of the place, one of the places of the city, and um, we planted millions of trees. Uh, they are growing, and they will be giving shade for these people of the same place that we, you, you were uh, listening before. So that's the only thing we'll see of. Parque Periurbano, we did it with Elemental. And this is um, another project also in the north of Chile, in the desert, in an oasis. And uh, it's a four hectare project for a hotel in San Pedro Atacama, in a little town, in an oasis, again in the desert. It was a project that wanted to educate visitors and tourists about native Atacameños agricultural production. We planted quinoa, corn, and others that would give the experience of getting to know what these native Atacameños had before and help the kitchen to prepare the local food. We brought back the agricultural tradition to that place that was abandoned for the last 30 years. We worked with the teachers of a local school and opened a new place for children to, to come and do their practice working in the field. Wentelauken is another project on the Pacific coast that I like to show it to see how it, it, it was very much about finding the essence of the place. This is, oh, came back, come back. This is how the place was and this is how it came. So I asked to blow the dust off and there it was hidden under the ground this beautiful rock.
then we had to walk on that rock so we built this bridge so, such an amazing place that couldn't do anything but cleaning what was there and helping to bring people there have some fire and look the stars the heart of the project of the house was this rock that was saved again of being taken out and this is before and after construction in situ you can see how here is just draw how this go is going to be but it's a work again done in, in situ and those are traffic signs to find a way to to the hide, hidden house that was built underground we took some rocks and placed them in the middle of nowhere to show where the people should go to get there this is an agricultural project in the center of chile and um, just um, to, sh to, to share with you the thoughts of that the beauty of the project should be the result of the necessity to keep no this should should have been erased too <laughs> we will go to the one that i want this one this is the project uh, that uh, it shows a great beauty but the thing is it was the result of the necessity to work with water to bring it uh, down. It's really heavy. It's really difficult. This is true. So here you can see before and after, and then when water came down all the way here to get to from in this path here to come through this place and finally got all in this lagoon that helped as a reservoir for the water process of uh, the park and the, pro the agricultural production so again i say aesthetic should be a result of our design but should come from solving a problem this is um, um, a park in the city which is a rest i showed it because it's a restoration a project in Santiago that brought water back to the place, again for irrigation. And uh, this is a place in the south that I worked in. I, it's in my place, and it's to show how important is the value of wildness, of simplicity, and especially I wanted to show you this that makes me tell you that i can assure that climate change is a reality trees are getting dry, uh, are dying so for this part of the presentation i would like to ask you to think of this let's nature be the star and if there is no nature around then we have to bring it we need so much to close to be close to nature and have a good life Lots of trees are so much better than lots of pavement. When you do your project, I would like to ask you to think more in trees than in pavement. When you plan a city or an urban space, I would like to ask you to understand the need of being in nature more than anything. I would like to remember you that concrete is not our material as landscape designers. We simple are so responsible for bringing trees back to our planet more than anything. I invite you to escape from our egos and think deeply in our partners' need to bring them to a better life, be, being back in nature. We also should help architects to see this. I'm going to show you now a couple of projects that were that have been done in China, in Berlin, uh, that, tell, that tells the same story, like bringing native trees from, that belong to the place, to these courtyards in a 
campus in Shanghai for business people to take a break in the middle of, of the day. Um, we own so much to Chinese um, vegetation. They have they they are they have native, magno I mean many many beautiful trees come from China. I learned after being there looking for what to work with. Between the bamboos, always under the trees. This is with Shankar, which is a. The architect of this building and Alejandro Aravena is the architect of this other building where I used the Meta Sequoia, which is a tree that was extended and China Chinese people already discovered it in 1944 and has become very popular. It's the Shanghai tree. It worked really well with this hard building designed by Elemental. So it's true that I love trees. <laughs> and then uh, it's um, a park in, in Berlin that is going to be open uh, this May. And uh, the proposal had to consider the weather condition of Berlin. So we were lucky to have very similar conditions to the south of Chile. I chose our native Notophagus tree this is how it looks in the south of Chile. And um, it's a tree that, beside that, it gives us the confirmation that we were all one piece of earth many years ago, because it's also native to New Zealand, Tasmania, and they found some in, in Antarctica. So it has a very special meaning. Then um, I brought something from the north of Chile that I am very much in love lately, getting all my projects with this travertine I found. And um, so n next May, May, I'm going to Berlin to do the opening of this um, little forest that is uh, going to be there in a permanent exhibition. And then the last thing is uh, I was invited to uh, do some ex exhibition in in the Biennale in Venice, 2016. And um, after I got the invitation, I went there to see what could I do in, in a Biennale end. OK. Uh, so I'll show you very fast that I brought some uh, leftover pieces from Chile uh, to display, to have these people sitting and go, being in nature because they didn't have where to stay. That was what I found in my trip. And as you can see, um, they they were working well because people used them very much. And what is very nice also is that. Uh, they decided to leave it as a permanent exhibition because it, they worked so well. And the last thing is I have some questions to leave you uh, to finish my presentation. I would like to leave you with some questions you may want to answer to yourself next time you will be in front of a new project, like the baby. What is the essence of a place? What is there I want to share with people? What is really necessary to have people getting the experience of the place? What are the materials I have available? What is the less expensive proposal I can bring? Thank you very much.
So thank you very much for like a fantastic and a amazing range of, of projects and approaches and ideas. Um, I think we've seen a huge range of, of approaches, scales, locations, and, and, and so on. I, I have a couple of questions or observations before we open it up for, for questions from the audience. But I suppose my, my first question really is, um, I mean, I'm, we're, I'm also conscious of the fact we're dealing with a huge area, so I don't want to get too imperialistic, but, you know, Latin America is a huge continent, and yet um, there's an ambiguity over, maybe over the profession in, in Latin America. And I wonder whether that actually creates opportunities for practice and allows for a more maybe expanded field of landscape architecture than perhaps we have here. And I wonder if you could each comment on that. <laughs> if you need a minute, that's fine. Anna Maria, you, you, you know. <laughs> Please. Oh my God. You're never stuck for words. <laughs> I talk too much. No, uh, I didn't say. Well, I guess that what you mean by ambiguity is the fact that landscape architecture hasn't been yet become a specialization with very defined borders. I mean, it is still a pretty blurry practice compared to other fields. Yes. But yet, it, I mean, from my experience thinking about the Amazon, I would say that as an architect who deeply admires landscape architecture and uh, its respect and consideration for nature, as you kept on repeating, you know, architects really need to consider nature as part of their palette of, uh, of materials. I guess that one thing that has really opened up for me in terms of this ambiguity of practice, which I enjoy, is that I feel that in the future, after uh, finishing the PhD, I'm going to be doing a lot of, um, a lot of uh, what is called agroecology when I go back <coughs> to Ecuador. Like I have come to understand agroecology as an architectural project. And that is something that maybe I'm doing because I have the freedom to practice architecture or landscape architecture or urban planning or urban design in a much more open field. Yeah. that demands responses that really question the limits between professions that have become so rigid in other places. Like as an architect, I'm supposed to do buildings. But how does that limit my materials and how does that limit yeah. my yeah. concepts and my relationship with nature? I feel that I have finally broken free from that and now I'm understanding an agroecological project as an architectural project, if that makes sense in terms of this ambiguity and the opportunity embedded in it. Okay, <laughs> uh -huh. I think uh, we have uh, so uh, complexity in our countries. There's so many things to do that, uh, uh, and uh, so much frustrations because of political de decisions and everything that the uh, compromise uh, to be poetical, no, like Teresa, and to understand these narratives and the, and the people in such different contexts is like a, um, un reto. It's a, a, a very big challenge to ourselves and landscapes. Goes, uh, se desborda. It's uh, getting just like uh, in, in all these things. So uh, there's no time to available to do so many things that we have to do. Okay. I, I don't know because I have been to Chile and South America for a short time now, so I will tell you my first impression in the last three years, and, um, and especially in Chile. And my feeling is that in terms of the discipline, like there is a tradition of landscape architecture, like Universidad Católica has a program in landscape architecture for a long time, um, but also other research centers and schools are opening to masters that are kind of interdiscipl interdisciplinary, between urban design, landscape architecture, architecture, they try to solve like a lot of issues that have been left aside 
Um, I feel there is a big uh, appetite for uh, landscape and landscape architecture because if the, um, really the, again, it's more of a feeling than a, an acknowledged thing, but compared, for example, to Europe, like the relation to nature and to this kind of primitive landscape, I feel that it's very strong in South America. But on the other hand, like the interest of the state and developers mm -hmm. and architects have been mostly on the built environment, like, uh, like providing a house, providing the construction of cities, infrastructure, and so on. And now there is really this need and this desire, I feel, to re-merge the two aspects. So we are assisting, with, like many competitions have been organized in the last years in South America. Um, you were showing many projects that are arising, driven by the state and so on, that are trying to bridge this gap again. Yes, do you want to? Do you want to? No, I think I... All right. It's enough, no? <laughs> she understands Chile very well. So, so that, that brings me to another question, and then I would like to open it up so to, to the audience. But one thing that was on my mind, and, and it, actually it was um, Anna Maria's presentation where you talked about finding the differences is important, it made me think about the other part of Latin America that's not represented here, the, the Portuguese-speaking uh, part of, of Latin America. And would any of you, could any of you comment on what is different in landscape architecture in Brazil versus the Spanish-speaking countries, which are represented in the conference? Then I can answer. I work with Brazilian landscape architects. Oh. I, I work with Brazilian landscape architects in my office. And um, I've been, I travel many times, and I've been looking at projects there. And uh, I think we have all the same basis as, La as Latin Americans. Um, we receive very much, even Portugal, Spain, or. But the the weather conditions, the geography is such a difference. So, I would say it's because of that that um, the the result of the projects, the the way they worked is. Is different. It could be like we are all under, around the Andes. Uh, very, we have so much in common. Uh, having the Pacific and the Andes around as close with these huge mountains, and Brazil has something different, special. But it's, it's diversity, which is so good, no? Well, Brazil has been my greatest intellectual challenge. It is definitely different. I think that looking at the history of um, Amazonian urbanization has made me grapple a little bit with the way the Portuguese settled, which is very different from the way the Spaniards settled. The Spaniards followed the law of Indies, whether they were in the Andes or in Iquitos in the Amazon. They used the grid. It was a very specific pattern that was placed in different places, regardless of the landscape. Whereas the, the Portuguese had a much more organic way of, uh, of an informal way of inhabiting the same landscapes. Another huge difference is the African contribution, which is in the Caribbean and in Brazil in particular, very strong. Places like the Quilombos in the Amazon, where there's this like fusion between indigenous cultures, tropical indigenous cultures and Afro-Brazilian culture is absolutely fascinating. They have more relationships to the kraals in Africa than, than to any local reference, if you wish. So I feel that's another, another thing that, not that Hispanic America doesn't have that, but it doesn't have it to the same degree because the Portuguese imported slaves much mm -hmm. more than the Spaniards. The Spaniards used the indigenous in the areas as the labor force during colonization also some African-American populations, but Brazil is so deeply African, and then there's a Portuguese influence, and just the fact that they, they have a, expanded into 60% of the Amazon makes them a, a tropical country in, in a magnitude. You know, Bulle Marx wouldn't exist without, without that tropicality that is so Brazilian. 
But thinking about the connections and not the differences, and looking at the archaeology of the place, there's a deep history of relationship between the Andes and the Amazon that should not be forgotten. These are not two separate entities. They're completely intertwined culturally and ecologically. The Amazon is generated mainly in the Amazons as a river, in, in the Andes as a river basin. It also has the influences from the Brazilian plateau below and also from the Venezuela, the Guinea plateau. But mainly, the majority of the sources are in, are in the Andes. And it's been demonstrated that the relationship between pre-Hispanic Andean cultures, Amazonian cultures, and Mesoamerican cultures created a huge circuit of conversations that are still alive. And the, they're a substructure that joins us in our differences. And both should be acknowledged. I, I think I cannot really answer to this question. Yes, for me it's difficult. I think we share our difficulties, and but the Andinian, no, we, we come from the Andes, and maybe we have uh, some kind of difference of resolving the problems, but I think there is more and more consciousness about what we are doing in the in the spaces, and the Brazilians have this like uh, open mind uh, thinking. And we, well, for example, in, in Bogota, we are in the high mountain. We are more reserved and think more before doing things. And uh, that kind of uh, way of acting maybe is a, a different way of approaching. But, uh, but, I, I, but I think uh, this consciousness on, on the complexity of the problems we share with the Brazilians. Thank you. Um, do we have, uh, I think we have time for a couple of questions from the audience. We have. Um, so this question uh, arises from Ana Maria's lecture, but I think it applies to um, everybody's. Um, and it is really about the, the role of politics in, in the shaping of the discipline of um, landscape architecture in Latin America, and how, the question is, how can we as designers, um, how should we engage in the politics of, of place, the politics of cities, and the politics of nature, um, and how can that be embedded in our work, and how do you think that has shaped also the discipline at, in, in our countries? Should we take another question, and let me give you a minute to think about that? Hi, um, is something very similar or like it follows up to that question is how effective are the top down uh, plans that are happening in Latin America and how, like how can we prove that they work and that they really are effective for the community, that they engage the community, that they also solve ecological pro problems, that, that we're changing the landscape. Ana Maria, do you want to? You want to start? Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I'm sitting with these brilliant women. We'd love to hear what they have to say first. I think it, 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 we are landscape architects have the commitment to be in politics uh, in each of our um, uh, everyday um, work because we live in, in very complex nations that are changing, that are transforming their territory. Uh, in, in, in the case of Colombia, we're in a process of peace in a very uh, uh, conflict time, and we need to share the, the, the things, and the, the things we transform the, the territory, and we need to, to talk each other uh, and to have uh, a position uh, because we are making a cul uh, culture territorial, a terri uh, cultura territorial. And uh, I, I, I cannot think about being landscape without uh, being involved with the people, talking with the people, hearing, and, and trying to transform uh, what the landscape with that we have done in the last years. We have seen all the cities in, in Colombia, in Latin America, and 
we haven't homogenized our landscapes. Uh, the solutions uh, with uh, functional and economical decisions. So I think there is a new way of transforming the, th the way of thinking now, and there is another way to resolve the problems, and that is that where landca landscape is uh, the place to be, because it's very near the human nature and the nature. So nothing, uh, everything is going to be different if we have that kind of perspective and change the one that was more, mostly functional, economical, and, and another way of, of thinking the past years of urbanism. Um, so my uh, like impression in working in the South American country, and this is also why like, I got so obsessed with who are the stakeholders and how do they define space and so on, is because I feel that these divisions are much stronger than in contexts that have uh, like a bigger pattern of interactions and uh, social um, conflicts and so on. So privatization still plays a big deal. Like um, a lot of power is in the hands of a few major companies, often national but also international. And, um, and these like political boundaries still have a big uh, uh, weight in the way like cities are shaped, for example, in the case of Santiago, the capital city, like most of the activities and the wealth is uh, concentrated in the few municipalities. And the same boundaries are like making sure that this will continue because uh, like taxes, for example, are almost not redistributed. So poor municipalities will keep being poor and the richer one will keep being richer. And, um, or the same with the relation between capital cities and the regional context, so how most of the economy is concentrated in the capital cities that are the most connected also with the rest of the world. And in this sense, I really think that um, because of landscape, you know, uh, because landscape design, I mean, can be very punctual. We have seen amazing projects here, but also it deals with public space, with boundaries, with openness, and um, and so there, there is really a, a possibility, I think, to mediate some of these uh, stronger political boundaries. And the top-down plans, um, I don't really know if I can answer to this, <laughs> but I think it's the same all over the world. I don't see a difference with this. Like um, many times, uh, we have seen, for example, all over the world with big events happening and the way whole areas are transformed in a way like keeping citizens uh, as the main, um, those that will gain the most uh, advantages out of this transformation, but in the end is mostly real estate or finance speculation. So really uh, with this, I don't see a difference with the South American context. Now it's your turn. Now it's my turn. <laughs> <laughs> Regarding the, the first question, you mentioned the, the poetics, and it's interesting that the conversation has become about the politics. So it makes me think about the connection between poetics and politics. And uh, in terms of Teresa's work, I think that in Latin America, if I think about the whole region, Chile is definitely the epitome of the poetic practice of architecture and landscape architecture. It doesn't surprise me that Chile has two Nobel Prizes who are poets, They're not novel writers like in Colombia with magical realism or in Peru with Vargas Llosa and more of a realistic, if you want, a social realistic critique. But uh, taking into account that that is a very Chilean uh, way of making things, I think that the connection in general in the region with the poetics and the politics of the poetic has to do a lot with the principles that we call the economy of means with the, the fascination with the raw and the wild. And all of you mentioned, and this is recurrent, simplicity, doing a lot with very little. Teresa mentioned, look at the materials that you have in the site. Look at what you have. Look at the local resources. We have very limited resources to solve very big problems. So that has created a very particular stance within this, this aesthetic of, or these poetics of, of 
which, which has a political ethos Im embedded in it, I think. So that combination, I think, is also very particular to Latin America right now. And regarding the other question in terms of the top down, eh, I don't think we have, since modernity, I don't think we have any top down dreams in Latin America. We are, you know, in cities that are 70% informal or less, let's say between 20 and 70% and, and informal. What place is there for a top down mega strategy that tries to do everything? None. That's why we work more with like piecemeal acupuncture, trying to link it through public transport, trying to find the nerves that link these points. I feel that Latinos are actually not fixated with the notion of a master plan from above. Uh, maybe that's what we have been lacking, is uh, planning. We deal more with in a reactive fashion with the circumstances that simply explode many of them based on policies that we're not designing, that have been designed from, from abroad. And I don't like thinking of things in a one-way direction, as I told you, like dependency theory. I think it's a two-way path. I think remittances, remittances coming back from the north to the south are as important as resources going from the south to the north. But there is a process in, in the fabrication of the marginal in Latin America it is undeniable that is some of these, like what Harvey calls a accumulation through this possession going on in the sense that the policies from what I've been reading in the planning school, which is where I'm right now, they look at the economy and the politics of things a little bit more than architects do. It's challenging. I'm, I'm having a hard time understanding everything they say, but from what I'm gathering, many of the policies that have deeply affected us are being designed abroad, political, economic policies. And this has been happening since the, col since the colonies in the sense that we are the hinterland of the global centers of power right now. We are the global hinterland. That I have no doubts about. We are the hinterland from which raw materials, minerals, you presented an excellent example, are being extracted and we are the agribusiness agri hinterland. Look at the Soybean Republic taking over Paraguay, the Bolivian Amazon, Brazil, Argentina, more than anything, and Uruguay. It's pretty scary to look at the relationship between companies like Monsanto or Sigenta, I think it's called, and our nation, our states, because the state plays a very important role in this whole articulation of Latin America as the hinterland of Europe, then the hinterland of the United States, and now undoubtedly the hinterland of China. China is the main commercial partner of most of our nations, and that relationship is being reinforced. Chile was the first nation to become, to have China as the main commercial partner. Mm -hmm. Yes. Since Brazil had China as the main commercial partner, Latin America changed forever, because Brazil is an Atlantic country and has been Atlantic traditionally. It had to shift the continent to open up routes to the Pacific. It is the most powerful nation in South America. So <clears throat> I feel that to acknowledge the fact that we're that hinterland is very important in terms of how do we practice politically our aesthetics of post, how, what could we call it? Post hinterland, <laughs> <laughs> you know, a, a South America. Like, will we emerge? It will take us 100 years. How long? I'm not sure. We must. <laughs> I think we, we have time for one more question, and then we... we... Oh, you're gonna... Already, all right, we'll, we'll take these two together. Can I go first? Uh, thank you for the presentations. As a Brazilian, I was really happy to see all this Latin American <laughs> landscapes in the debate on, and that's pretty much of my question. I want you to put together the two issues that I already talked here in this morning, and I think it's very uh, interesting about when you talk about boundaries. You, all, like each one of the presentations show how we have many boundaries in Latin American contexts like rural and urban, public and private, and periphery, center, gated communities, and so on. At the same time, I think we are quite different in the and the kind of formation or the professions we are, because 
in the graduation, we are architects and urbanists in the most of the cases. So as an architect, we think about the architecture, the building, but the, the city, the urban plan, and the, the, the territory. So as a formation, we, have a, we, we cross all those scales. And I will think about the lines and the connections that you use as a matter for me in, in your project. How can we construct these lines of connections? I don't want like a straight answer, but more a reflection, because I think we have a lot of common in Brazil. Like Brazil, it's not a unity. It's a, it's a one country, but it's very different regionally in the climate and, and everything. And maybe we are struggling with this in the Brazilian debate, but we don't struggle with our partners in Latin America. I think we should cross the Andes in, some time, in a certain way. I don't know. Can we take the second question and then, and then me? Um, thank you so much for these um, thought provoking speeches and I want to share first of all a sentence I learned just yesterday. Somos arroyos del mismo rio. And I believe that this river <laughs> is landscape. And I did enjoy so much our cross-cultural dialogue today. It's not a monologue, it's a dialogue. And so I have a question for Chile. And uh, I like it in Banadas, and, uh, but I've never been there. So I'm curious. Um, I really like your sentence. So need comes first, and then comes aesthetics. So in a country like Chile, you have a lot of risks, natural disasters, especially it's a very, very seismic country. And then you have also the power structure. You have conflict with indigenous people, like the Mapuche people. So um, when you do landscape architecture, do you also consider how to, let's say, mitigate the natural risks and also how to promote social inclusion? Yeah. And also for the Colombia case, I have a big love for Colombia because of my favorite writer. <laughs> and also, yeah. Uh, and I know something about Bogota. I'm very interested into the rural, urban, connection, because actually it's really, really a unitary landscape. But we sometimes we just uh, deliberately interrupt the connection between the rural landscape and the urban landscape. So um, maybe these cases can also serve uh, as a very, very important reference for Asian countries. Thank you. We're we're over time, so if you could maybe keep the answers uh, short. We would like to... Rita? I didn't get very well the, the question, that's the thing. Yeah, well... So how can you... It was more of a comment, I think, mm. about, about borders and um, conversation with, with Brazil. Um, yes. Can I say something? It's kind of, yeah. you, maybe you have an idea because I, it's like, it's difficult for me to. Yes, no, um, it's not like, um, it's more of a personal thing, but actually my first encounter with the world of landscape, I studied architecture, and I was starting my PhD in, and then um, in urban design and planning. And, but my first encounter with the landscape was during my uh, master thesis. I have an obsession, I think, because I did my master thesis on Latin America and on the River Plata system. And that's really where I discovered like landscape and landscape architecture as a way to connect uh, boundary uh, borders that in a way do not really exist in a physical way. Mm -hmm. So uh, like my thesis was on the River Plata system that connects uh, Buenos Aires, Montevideo, and goes through Argentina, Rosario, Santa Fe, goes, runs through Asuncion in Paraguay, but it's actually um, the source is in Sao Paulo very near to Sao Paulo. And the original uh, populations like the Guarani, for example, that live in Paraguay and in Brazil, um, they use it as a, um, 
as their main communication system. And it was like the origin of the villages and so on. And the, so in a way, this double connection between um, something that could link this different landscape. But on the other hand, in the contemporary series, now it has changed in the last 10 years, I think. But uh, still, for example, the river was a big uh, boundary, a big um, border between what was the natural, like that floods and where most of the informal settlements are located, and what is the modern city built on top of it with concrete and so on. So um, I think that the question of boundaries is absolutely relevant in terms that they can be the place for diversity uh, to happen and to regenerate. And um, I don't know, I always like to think in the South American context uh, on this double meaning of the boundary as a connection and as a place of friction, which I think, and I don't know if this answers to anything of yours. And the Chile, uh, yes, there are projects of uh, mitigation, of uh, preventing risk. I would say that the most famous one is the plan of Concepcion by Elemental. I don't know if, Teresa, you are involved in that as well? No, no I just was in Calama. Ah, OK. And, the, um, and yes, of course, they're, they're like, especially in the last years, they're trying to see how can um, landscape become a medium to uh, mitigate some of the effects, for example, of tsunamis or um, earthquakes. And um, I haven't really worked on that. Like, to me, for example, the thesis I was showing on Calama, they were coming to me asking to work on the natural disasters, like uh, earthquakes and tsunamis. And I was telling them that mining, in the way, is a plant disaster, that this is also something that is not taking into account, but one day will hit the context. And so, in a way, I think the methodology with which you work is kind of shared. But it's coming. All, everything is yes. cycled, so we yes. are growing. We are making things better, little by little. Shall we break for lunch? Um, and we meet again at, at 1.30. Right? Yeah, so we're going to reconvene at 1.30. Thank you to all of you for a wonderful conversation. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, you'll, be able to hear again from, you'll be able to hear again from these four speakers at 3.30 for our final roundtable with our other four speakers. But we'll be back here at 1.30. Thank you.